a population of 41 million are now living in the cities. And 1848, 1851 is the sort of pivot point where there become more people living in, in the towns than um, in the uh, countryside. So this is a dramatic um, social uh, change. London was, of course, a big part of this story because there was no other city of the scale of London. It consistently accounted for somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the population of Britain um, as a whole. There was no other city in the world of its size. Okay? Paris had been an equivalent size in 1750, but by 1900 London was two and a half times uh, the size of um, uh, uh, was two and a half the size of the time, size of Paris. And New York was half the size of London um, at that point. So London is a juggernaut. You know, there's nothing else like it. But there are loads of other cities growing just as fast as London, just on a smaller scale. Indeed, some cities are growing even faster. The new industrial cities in the north of England grow much, much more dramatically, even from a smaller uh, uh, base. So I'll give you uh, two um, examples of this. Bradford um, uh, in Yorkshire in 1801 had 13,000 people living there. Um, in 1851 had 104,000 people living there. Um, uh, 13,000 to 104,000. Manchester um, had 75,000 people living in it in 1801. By 1851, it had over 300,000. Okay, so in the space of a couple of generations, really, these new industrial cities had grown up um, uh, overnight. And by 1851, there were at least nine cities of a, with a population of more than 100,000, whereas in uh, 1800, there'd just been just one, and that was London. So people moving to the towns big time, but that's not the only pattern of migration. Migration was also increasingly imperial in scope. Okay? And we have to think of the mass migration of peoples across the British Empire. Slavery is obviously you know, the key example of that. Three million slaves moved um, uh, 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 in British ships during the 18th century. In the beginning of the 19th century, when they replaced slavery with forms of indentured laborers, um, uh, equal numbers of people are transferred. By the end of the 19th century, something like 4 million indentured laborers, laborers had been moved across the, um, uh, uh, the British Empire. Ireland is another great example of this. Um, the Irish were the first colonial population to move to Britain. Okay? Um, and that happens very dramatically after the famine, which I'll talk to you about next week. So in 1841, between 1841 and 1861, the, popula the Irish population in Britain doubles from 415,000 to 800 and... <laughs> My goodness, bless you. <laughs> that was a stunning, <laughs> stunning example of the sneeze. Um, there were also, of course, emigrants. Emigrants moving out of Britain, which we know began um, uh, with the passage to uh, the Caribbean and to North America, um, but also um, from, the, um, uh, from the beginning of the 19th century, increasing numbers of emigrants to the other white settler colonies. You know, Canada, um, uh, uh, Australia, um, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, um, and so forth. Right, transport. These rather grimy, um, unsatisfactory maps tell the story, basically, of the growth of the, um, uh, uh, the road network in Britain and the growth of the rail network. Um, first came roads. Roads began being rebuilt in the 1740s. Canals came next, and they began to be constructed in the 1770s. Railways came after that in the 1820s and 1830s. 
and then steam shipping from the 1840s. All of these forms of transport enabled goods, people, and news to be conveyed faster and over greater distances than they ever had been before. They helped literally forge together, provide an infrastructure that connected together first the nation state and then the empire um, at large. In 18, by 1839, Britain had 120,000 miles of roads. Okay? Now, 98% of them are maintained locally, um, were run either by local parishes, which is the unit of government that surrounds every church um, uh, in Britain, or by turnpike trusts, by basically commercial companies that build roads, uh, roads and then charge um, uh, tolls. There are basically only two state-constructed road projects, and surprise, 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 they're built to for military purposes, okay? for the conveyance of troops, effectively, from London up to Edinburgh, after, um, and uh, from uh, uh, London through Wales and into Ireland, uh, through Hollyhead, up here. Uh, up here. Um, by the 1830s, the, um, there are new standards, new national standards laid down that roads now have to meet with a smooth macadam and macadamized paving um, and mounded in the middle so you could have drainage either side. In other words, roads were no longer going to be basically mud and dirt that you had to go around the edges of. Now they had to have smooth, uh, smooth surfaces with good drainage in order to um, uh, facilitate speed of travel, not least for the government's own postal system, which was established um, uh, uh, in the 18th century but became hugely important from the 1780s as a way of conveying official information by the government um, uh, and, of course, uh, 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 passengers as well. They used to ride um, inside the... Um, uh, uh, Inside the, inside the carriages or sometimes on top. By the 1830s, 1,500 coaches were leaving London every week um, uh, and spreading right across um, the country and they were travelling five times faster than they had done in the 1750s. So the figures that you see at the bottom here uh, are the, 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 the reduction of the amount of time it takes you to travel from Bristol to London. I mean, very... Um, uh, very dramatic uh, differences. The country is becoming smaller, is becoming more uh, uh, connected. The same thing happens, of course, with rail. And rail, um, uh, which really begins taking off in the 1830s and 1840s and becomes a colonial phenomena in India, especially in the 18, uh, in the 1850s. And again, it's a way of knitting together, not just uh, uh, the nation, but the empire. So when Phileas Fogg has his wager that he can get around the world in 80 days, he's having his wager that he can do that because a new railway has just opened up um, uh, in Cal um, uh, um, um, out of Calcutta, and he reckons he can do it from steamships and, and rail and get around the whole world. That, that whole story is predicated upon this process of the world getting... Um, at smaller and faster. Okay, moving on. There's a lot of stuff I'm throwing at you and we're going to come back to a lot of this. So this is just like a big, grand overview. So don't worry if, if, if it doesn't all um, uh, stick. There's a big story about the rise of print culture, but I'm just going to talk to you today about newspapers. There are two and a half thousand newspapers in circulation in total in 1700, and that increases to 17,000 by 1800, so from two and a half thousand to 17,000 in the space of a century. <coughs> by 1844, they're 55,000, so a really substantive leap again at around the same time at the beginning 
of the 19th century. So that's two and a half to 17 to 55, basically 1700, 1800, 1844. There's one provincial newspaper, that is one newspaper published outside of London in 1700. Um, and by 1855, they're 289. Okay? And, and that's after 1855, it goes absolutely crazy because they repeal a, a, a tax on newspapers that, that means that it goes crazy. But um, moreover, more and more people are being able to read these newspapers. Literacy rates increase from 50 to 66 percent between 1750 and 1850. But even if you were illiterate, many of these papers had multiple readers. Okay, that is to say, people read newspapers out aloud at the pub, on the, on the green, you know, um, uh, 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 at home. Okay? It's estimated that every, London, every newspaper in London at the beginning of the 19th century was read by at least 30 people. Okay? So th this is, not, this is a, a different type of viral news spreading through, um, uh, through um, uh, uh, the hard copy of the paper um, itself. Similar story about the post. I've already talked to you about the postal system being part of the key catalyst for the development of roads. Um, but in 1840, Britain introduces the penny post, where you could send a, a, a letter um, for a penny over any distance. 57 million letters are sent in that year alone after the introduction of the penny post. Okay? So again, news, information, communication spreading with greater ease and facility across uh, the, um, uh, uh, the country. Part of what this does with the new, with the tra new transport and communication infrastructure is provide a, a national time for the first time. Okay? Up until the 1840s, 1850s, most places had their own time rhythm. Okay, and it was derived from, of course, the sun still. And they had their clocks, but basically every town, you know, every big town had its own town rhythm, which meant when the railway started going, very inconveniently, you could arrive at a destination, having left London, say, at 11 o'clock, and you could pull in to, 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 to Manchester, and there'd be a 10-minute you know, time difference between those, two, um, uh, between those two cities. The spread of the railways and the spread of the telegraph system in the 1850s basically knits the country together into one time system. And the last remaining evidence of this is the, uh, is the timepiece on, uh, on the Bristol Guild Hall, Guild Hall that had these two um, minute hands. Um, uh, uh, the black one um, uh, is the Bristol time and the red one is what becomes standardized national time that you know as Greenwich Mean Time. Greenwich Mean Time okay, gets established in 1884, okay, that Greenwich becomes the centre of an imperial and global time system um, uh, in 1884, four years after they passed the legislation finally that everybody in Britain has to get behind at Greenwich um, Mean Time. Okay? So again, country being pulled together, knitted together, here is the example of time. I'm going to have to speed up, so you think I'm going fast now, but you haven't seen anything yet. Um, uh, the story that I basically want to tell here is that in this new society, okay, where the country is getting smaller, people are more mobile over greater distances, pe people are now beginning increasingly to live around people that they don't know rather than staying in communities where they know everybody, new patterns of association and sociability have to get elaborated. Okay? You have to try and figure out how you behave around strangers. Okay? So there are many, many, and I'll talk to you about more about this in a couple of weeks, I think, there are many, many guides written to how you behave yourself in a railway compartment with people that you don't know, how you walk down the street, whether you engage people with eye, with eye contact, whether it's okay to, you know, to spit in front of them, you know, whether you should fart in a, in, a, in a public place, all of this type of thing. Literally, all the things that we take for granted, all the way, ways that we can seamlessly move through the world because we just, you know, have learned that from birth. 
All of this was having to be established pretty much for the first time.